Is it uh, possible to speak to Sheila, please? This is Sheila. Hello, Sheila. This is Jeffrey Brisson, the drummer. Hey, thank you so much for calling, Jeff. How are you doing? <laughs> well, I'm in America, so that can't be bad, can it? <laughs> I'm so glad that you're going to be performing in Cookville, too, really soon. Yeah. Well, thanks to Dan Ely, yes. he's uh, He's just been wonderful organizing everything, and it's been a lot of... A lot of putting together for him, but uh, yeah, I'm 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 looking forward to it now. Now the first uh, first of the gigs here at um, you know the park, uh, the uh, Abbey Road on the river, and uh, the next thing is Dan, and Dan's the one that uh, has got the biggest history for me personally, and and our relationship going back to 1974. Yes, talk about that a little bit. That's what I wanted to know. How how did you meet Dan? And you guys have kind of kept in touch throughout these years. Well, it came about because Dan is an exceedingly creative person. And he managed to get himself into our circle by um, posing as a uh, an interviewer for an English rock paper, you know, like a reporter. Yes. And... Because he's a personable guy, he came along and the accreditation was accepted. And from that moment on, he became part of our team there. He was there every day and he was just great. And you're talking about on Junior's Farm, that's in Lebanon, Tennessee. And that's where Paul, he talked to Curly Putnam Jr., which owned Junior's Farm. That He is Junior, 133-acre farm that's just outside of Nashville in Lebanon. The reason Paul got this farm was uh, he rented it so you guys could practice as a new member of Wings. You're the drummer at that time. Did you think it was very different practicing somewhere like that when you're away from, you know, the, the pressures of life and you're just on this farm? Did it help bond the band like Paul was wanting? Well, that's the whole idea of it. There's, as, you know, you've, you've ticked all the boxes there with everything you've said. The idea of being away from all your other sort of personal interests in life and just together and focusing on being a band highlights all the strengths and weaknesses that every individual on the planet has. And bands are a kind of peculiar social environment. So, yeah, it's quite a it's quite a perceptive thing to do to be able to create that, you know, like six, seven weeks down tools and just be together. Uh, brings out sometimes the best and sometimes the worst in people. And, uh, you know, Paul McCartney is one of probably the biggest stars on the universe in terms of popular music i guess he has to step slightly differently from when if you're just the local guys in a local town and you're putting your band together you know you basically all know each other or you have a history or you know somebody who knows somebody and up the scale if you do that and it goes wrong or the you know people aren't the right people you'd know it very quickly but when you've got kind of a bunch of strangers then you put them together, then that's kind of the best way to find out. I, looking back, I never I never thought of it like that, but it's. I think you're accurate in the way you describe that. Well, Jeff, you had been a member of some other bands before you were hired with Wings. How was the process? How did you get to be a part of Wings? Well, <laughs> this is a hell of a story. How long have we got? Okay, <laughs> the basic thing was in those days, this is all pre-internet, so the the word went out through the Melody Maker, which was the encyclopedia, the media, the the Bible of of music in England. And they had a story that uh, Paul was looking for a drummer. Now the office was inundated with a- applicants, hundreds I heard, and I was with the uh, the manager of Fleetwood Mac one evening, a friend of mine, Clifford Davis. And he said, are you going for the Wings audition? And I said, well, I'd like to, but, you know, in those days, and probably still is, McCartney Productions was ex-directory, so you couldn't just phone it up. So I said, I don't have the number. I don't know, you know, how to do it. So he said, stay in tomorrow morning, and I'll call you the number of the office, which he did. So I phoned up McCartney Productions Limited, MPL, and they said, well, you're, you're too late. The list is closed. We've had hundreds of applicants and, uh, you know, better luck next time kind of thing. Well, I still to this day don't know quite what happened, but 
Myself and Alan Crowther, who was the guy responsible for taking care of that and, and kind of Paul's personal, um, I, I, we got into conversation and, and, and he said, you know what, I'm going to put you on the list. So then the next level was a call, a phone call, and the Wings management hired a big West End theatre, block booked it for three days, and they'd narrowed the applicants down to 52, and they hired in some, some session players and put them on the stage, and Paul and the management and the other members of the band, Danny and Jimmy, Linda, sat in the theatre and watched all these guys for three days audition, of which I was one of them. So we got to see some other drummers play. Mitch Mitchell, in fact, from Hendrix, which surprised me. I didn't even think he should be auditioning. He should have just got the job, you know. Um, and another drummers we saw, quite a few named drummers were there. So anyway, we get through that, and uh, nobody says anything. And a few days later, I get a call. And yeah, they're very pleased with me. And would I be prepared to come along to um, a ballroom in Camden Town, London, and meet Paul and play with the guys personally, you know, a proper audition with them. So I managed to get the lady on the phone to tell me more than she was supposed to, and I, there was five guys that were the uh, shortlist. And that next audition, we were allocated either a morning or an afternoon. So uh, I turned up for my slot, and I played with Matt Paul and uh, the other guys, and we played... And I went home. So, and I thought, that's it. I I played with Paul McCartney. That'd do me. That's that's just great. A couple of days go by, and I get a phone call. Yes, we're very very pleased with you. And would you come along and and spend all day? And um, you know, we go out for lunch and just hang out as well as do the music. I said, yeah, that's fine. In fact, I found out out who I was up against in the first instance, and I was a bit mortified because it was Elton John's drummer, Rod Stewart's drummer. Dave Edmonds' drummer, who went on to be Dire Straits' drummer, and uh, Rob Townsend, who was in groups called Family, Medicine Head, and, and, the, and the Manfreds. So I thought, oh dear, <clears throat> I go and see these guys play. This is, uh, this is going to be a tough call. Anyway, I get my day, and everybody's uh, polite and nice, and we had, a, you know, we had some fun, and we laughed, and this, that, and the other. And... Um, where I lived, I had a big field in front of my house, and I was out jogging, and uh, my then ex-wife opens the uh, bedroom windows and shouts, Paul McCarter's on the phone. And uh, so I ran in, panting, and um, tells me I've got the gig. So that's how that all unfolded. Long story, but that's how it was. And you almost missed being on the list to play, and then you made it as his drummer. I know. It's, it's, it's just one of those life anomalies that are bizarre, bizarre. If, if Alan Crowther hadn't... Uh, we carried on engaging in conversation, that would never have happened. He was a lovely man, and unfortunately, he's no longer with us. How was it working with Paul? Was it a special time for you? Were you a big fan of the Beatles, as everyone else was during that time? Yes. I had seen the Beatles live. The whole of England was fans of the Beatles. They were so big that when they came back from America, and, and England reads a lot of newspapers, just the headlines just said, they're back. And you just knew who they were talking about. And they were just a true phenomenon, not only with their great contribution to songs, and but just did for England what Elvis Presley did for rock and roll music in America. Um, you know, he changed everything, and they changed everything. And, and you know, and in the wake of them, you, we had the Stones, the Hollies, the Who, the Kinks, you know, the, just unprecedented, this great number of groups, and I've forgotten a lot uh, to mention there, Jerry and the Pacemakers, and they were all different. You And the Searchers of another great group. And you, as soon as you heard the next record, you knew who it was, and that's that's never been repeated. That was of its time, and and like I've just played at uh, Abbey Road on the river, and there's bands playing all those songs, and there's an audience out there that that still appreciates and loves all that stuff. You know, as as I do, I still listen to all the '60s stuff, and yeah, it's it's not only do is is it memory lane, but it, they're just such great songs, and that's it. Good songs stand up. Look, you know, you think of uh, the songs of Frank Sinatra. Ella Fitzgerald, all those great songwriters that produce those lovely uh, songs, they still sound great, and they're still beautiful songs. 
I was a Beatles fan. I had I had the record. I bought the records, you know, like everybody else. They were just great songs. So yeah, I was just sitting there and looking at him and just thinking, you got to do your job. You got to play and you got to make the song right. So you you you're distracted. Well, whichever way you look at it, you're distracted because it's Paul McCartney or you're distracted because you've got to get the song right. So uh, it's part and parcel. And some of those things you look back on with uh, a different view. But I do remember distinctly thinking, that's Paul there, you know, and that's amazing. Jeff, 1974 was when Paul McCartney and Wings practiced at Junior's Farm, came together as a band for the first time. What do you remember about being on Junior's Farm in Tennessee? Well, I remember all of it. It was my my first visit to America, and growing up after the war, I have a deep appreciation of what the great American military personnel did for saving us. Had it not been for them and our Commonwealth allies, then I would be, if alive, would be speaking German. So... To visit this country was kind of like a very special feeling and it changed, everything changed for my generation with Elvis Presley, Little Richard, all that rock and roll music and then you had the Marlon Brandos, the James Deans, uh, Henry Miller, Jack Kerouac, the authors, Phil Silvers on the TV with Sergeant Bilko. I, I mean... It was all coming from America, so it was the avalanche of culture and change. Were you aware that that you were in the state that Elvis Presley lived? Tennessee? Yes. um, Yeah, and and subsequent on another visit, I went to Graceland. I have a deep sense of gratitude going back to the war thing because I grew up on bomb sites. My playgrounds were bomb sites. We had ration books because... uh, There wasn't enough food. So my perspective is, and and my generation, because Paul, you know, we talk about this, we're of a similar age, and the influence. In fact, at that audition, the very first song I played, Paul said, do you like rock and roll? And I said, Paul, come on, man, we're the same generation. Of course I love rock and roll. So he said, will we play Lucille? Do you know it? I said, yeah, which version? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, Little Richard... And the Everleys both nailed it, but, you know, rhythmically, they're very different. And he said, oh, you know your stuff. And that's, that was the very first song we played together it was Lucille, which is a 50s rock and roll song, first recorded by Little Richard, which is a killer version. And then the Everleys, which changed it, which is also a killer version. And we ended up doing the Everleys uh, style because the drumming's very different. The great Buddy Harmon played on the Everleys record. So... Um, yeah, so that's how that came about in terms of my sense of awe and gratitude and just how just how America was, the what we call the supermarkets, the stores. I just think if the rest of the world came in and saw an American food store, they would just be absolutely amazed, amazed what uh, how the, the produce, the variety, the size of it. And obviously, if you're born and bred here, you, you just take it as normal. But it's it's pretty damn impressive. So you come over from Europe and you've got to, you're playing with Paul McCartney, the biggest pop band ever, and um, a member of, and you're in the United States. So it's it's just an amazing experience. That's that's There's no other way I can explain it. Well, we're so excited that you're going to be playing Cookville with Merseyside, Dan Ely's band, and you're going to be on drums with them. And I know he's excited playing with you as well. And you, I bet you're excited getting together again and, and playing and reliving these memories. Yes. Well, I have to say a special thanks to Dan Ely because he's he's organizing it all. It was his idea. It's a great idea. And... You know, when you're that side of the fence doing the organising and and you've got to cross your T's and dot your I's and get it correct, that's a lot of work. And he's got to play and be in the band, so he's got to wear two hats. He's a performer and he's an organiser, and that's a big task. But, I mean, Dan's up to the task. He's, He's a very, very accomplished, very together man. And I've got to say, he's been extremely kind and 
gracious and considerate to me at every single juncture and every single level. And yes, we really are looking forward to coming down there. And, and I said it on the microphone yesterday. I said it was really lovely because when you tour America and bands, you, you are in a bit of a cocoon. You're kind of sealed unit. And the people around you are really nice, but you don't you don't sometimes get the chance to really meet the, the general American people. And on, on this trip, I've been able to do that, and that's been that's been wonderful. And Dan's facilitated every problem, every you know, ironed out any of the you know little crinkles you get in in things in life. Oh, Dan, I've got a problem here. Oh, Dan, this. He's he's just been. Mr. Dynamo, he's wonderful. And he's the reason I'm getting to talk to you right now, and I feel very lucky to be talking to you, Jeff. And then you're oh, so humble. You. I mean, people want to hear the stories. And, and, I mean, 45 years of stories that you've got, and I thank you for sharing a little bit of it with us. And I can't wait to see you perform. No, it's been my pleasure. Jeff Britton, the former Wings drummer with Paul McCartney, is who I've been speaking to. Jeff, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Sheila, thank you. Thank you for your courtesies and time. And thanks, American people, again for saving us. Thank you all. Bye-bye.